To this point, it should be clear that the perspective on CSR matters a great deal. So this lecture focuses on the question of what it means to think globally, act locally. We often hear terms like local, and we know that it's about social responsibility, but what it actually means is problematic. So we'll use this podcast to examine the global-local dichotomy with some cross-cultural comparisons of perceptions of social responsibility. The concept of thinking globally and acting locally is attributed to Sir Patrick Geddes. Living between 1854 and 1932, he was a Scottish biologist, sociologist, geographer, philanthropist, and pioneering town planner. He was the guy for all occasions. But he's known for his innovative thinking in the fields of urban planning and sociology. He developed city plans in Edinburgh, but also in countries like Palestine and India, most focusing on how to improve slums and environmental plans in those areas. For example, his principles for town planning in Bombay demonstrate his views on the relationship between social processes and spatial form, and the intimate and casual connections between the social development of an individual and their cultural and physical environment. So this list on the slide represents presents his values in city planning. From the Geddes perspective, think globally, act locally, urges people to consider the health of the entire planet and to take action in their own communities and cities. So long before governments began enforcing environmental laws, people were coming together to protect habitats and organisms that live within them. But these efforts are known as grassroots efforts, so they occur at a local level and are primarily run by volunteers and helpers. So as a formal initial initiative, Think Globally and Act Locally originally began at this grassroots level, but now it's a global concept and has a fairly high level of importance. So it's not just volunteers who take the environment to consideration, it's an alliance of corporations, governments, education, and local communities. However, today this perspective is challenging because it can mean very different things to different people. So by taking a look at what social responsibility means around the world, we can begin to see where conflict and challenges in implementing social responsibility initiatives can emerge. Now, for purposes of consistent comparison, we're just going to look at collectivist cultures. Ideally, these are cultures where social responsibility initiatives should be the most successful because of the focus on collective identity and social good. Let's begin with an overview of CSR in Scandinavia. So the region is characterized by stable labor relations and is based typically on two powerful bargaining groups agreeing mutually or bilaterally on how to distribute the results of individual productivity. They seek balance in the working life. So this is introduced and supported by a bargaining system rather than legal regulation. And these countries also are strong social democracies. The governments have a lot of power, but they work in strong alliance with trade unions, and so they've committed an extensive welfare and social security system with full employment as their absolute objective. Now, while CSR in Scandinavia, like anywhere else, isn't perfect, there are certainly cases and examples of things run amok. The collective attitudes, approach to government, and cultural values make CSR make sense. That said, the ethic of CSR works there really well because it relies on dialogue, critique, negotiation, engagement between different groups, but also a broad sense of trust between people, corporations, governments, and nonprofits, as well as an interest and sensitivity to a variety of stakeholders. It is, in a lot of ways, the perfect location for social responsibility. But if we shift this to another type of collectivist culture, let's take a look at an East Asian perspective on social responsibility and social organization. Initially, let's keep in mind that Eastern Asia is incredibly diverse. Culturally, sociologically, geographically, it's far from homogenous. But for the most part, business practice in East Asia can be understood to derive from a common Confucian heritage. However, Japanese culture is also quite different. So even though they've been culturally influenced by the early Chinese influence Confucian ideals, there are some significant differences there. That said, Confucian influence across the region typically means that all people maintain family-based relationships. This means there are obligations between members of society. As a basis of morality, there is a strong group identification. There's also a utilitarian philosophy, do the greatest good for the greatest number of people. 
And there are five relationships that dictate really the importance of personal power and duties for guidance. So if we understand these five relationships, then it helps to make a clear understanding of the interactions and the expectations for social responsibility much more successful. So on its face, this approach is harmonious with most conceptualizations of social responsibility. However, research suggests that CSR efforts are often challenging in Eastern Asia because of corruption, cronyism, and models of corporate governance. So four critical factors that make CSR problematic in the region is that first, law enforcement is sometimes poor. Second, even though traditional moral principles are highly valuable, sometimes powerful individuals violate them and there's little that can actually be done to counter this. Third, the power structures in these areas often mean that money and resources that are meant to support CSR initiatives are siphoned elsewhere. And fourth, despite these limitations, there's a great potential, though, for CSR to be successful and good examples of it because of the collectivist social structures in the region. So where the initiatives are successful, they tend to be really successful. Next, if we move to our final illustrative collectivist culture, let's take a look at CSR in Mexico. To understand Mexican culture, we can characterize it using some of Hofstad's dimensions of culture to better understand it. Typically, there's a high sense of power distance that centralized organizations are emphasized where autocratic or paternalistic models of leadership dominate. There's a high level of uncertainty performance, so there's strong preference for well-defined, clear rules. But there are high collectivist attitudes. Employees are very likely to go along with the organizations because they value the relationships and the security provided by the organizations. It's also characterized as a highly masculine society. So where weakness and femininity are cultural signs of submission, they're not highly valued in interactions. So what does this mean for CSR? Tra the tradition of solidarity and, and expectation of care is so valued in Mexican society that it makes CSR really effective to be implemented. So for example, there's an assumption that the boss has an obligation to his or her employees, and by showing that obligation, they gain public acceptance. So the boss is viewed as doing good to their employees in the community. They gain political capital and local power by acting in ways that benefits the com community as well as the individual employees. So from a corporate or legal perspective, there's little agreement as to what CSR in Mexico is and what it should look like and what kinds of companies should accompany it. But what it really means is there's no clear way to differentiate it from philanthropy. But there is a strong emphasis on communication. Because the community ties, we typically see in Mexico a lot of conversation about what it means to be tied to the community. So it's tied to local practices and characteristics of corporate identity. So even when we take into consideration collectivist cultures, we see really different applications of CSR. When we ask the question of what does CSR mean in a global context, the answer is very unclear. But the similarities in the process, the similarities in the values, and the goals of associated with them suggest that CSR, we can start to understand it because we can start to to identify and evaluate examples of it and how effective or relatively ineffective those can be.